cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, our praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, our praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever.
Zion Church, 8.30, how we doing? Who's ready to worship? Who came expecting to the house of God today? Let's all stand to our feet. We're gonna get rolling, start on time. Hey, right there where we are, all across this room, can we just lift our hands? Yeah, let's lift them high. Father, we thank you, God. Lord, we ask that you would be enthroned on the praises of your people today. We have come with thanksgiving on our hearts and praise on our lips, Jesus. Would you receive our songs, our heart cries? Because you're worthy, 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 worthy of every song. Receive it today, King Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Let's go. Yes, put your hands together. Hey. Just for you, Lord. Cause I, cause I. 
Yeah, come on, let's press in. I want to be the oil. I want to be a laid down lover. Yeah, come on, let that be our prayer today. We want to be, we want to be the oil. We want to be the sacrifice. I want to be a laid down lover. Oh, I want to be the oil. Oh, it's our prayer today.
Yeah, sing that again. Let that rise. Say, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Come on, if that's your prayer today, release your hunger in this place. Come on, lift, lift your lovesick song to Him, God. Father, take away everything else, but just give us your presence, God. If your presence is hearts and let the Lord sing this over us. Your name is like honey on my lips. 
your spirit's like water to my soul. God, your word is a line to my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Cause Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Tell him today. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, more than anything. Oh, let it rise. Cause Jesus, I love you. Jesus, we love you, we love you. That's why we're here today, Jesus, I love you. That's the only reason why we're here, it's for love more than anything. Because oh. we cry hope. time we cry. Oh, we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy.
Jesus worthy There is no one Only Jesus Who else is worthy Who else is worthy There is no one Only Jesus There is no Jesus seated on the throne above God high and lifted up father we celebrate you today king of glory we give you permission here today king of glory can we just say that father I give you permission all across this room Jesus we give you permission Holy Spirit Spirit of the Living God we give you permission today in this service to have your way King Jesus to receive all the honor all the praise I'm not gonna hold it back today, but I'm gonna open my own lips, my own mouth. I'm not gonna let Joey jump around, make a fool of himself alone. We are gonna lift up a shot of praise today. You guys ready? We're gonna practice, because that's what we'll be preaching on today, all right? On the count of three, we're gonna lift up our craziest, most passionate, most Latin American fiery praise scream in this place. Y'all ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Yeah, guys, welcome to Zion Church. My name is Joey. Such an honor to be with you guys. Turn the person next to you, give them a hug, introduce yourself, say what's good, wipe off your sweat. Legends, you guys are released. Good morning, Zion. Find your seat. Happy to have you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Logan, and this is Jeremy, and we're excited to be here with you all this morning. But I want to start off by just welcoming first-time guests. You know, we know it can be a lot to get here sometimes, and we are truly happy to have you. And we know that God has called you here specifically because he has a plan and a purpose for your life, and we're excited to partner with you, just whatever that is. Yeah, and listen, we had something really special we wanted to share with you today. Uh, about two and a half years ago was the first time we ever did Zion Conference, all right? It was a powerful, powerful weekend, and I know for myself included, for Kendall and I, it was one of our first encounters with Zion. That's where I learned that these people really like to worship. It was a crazy experience. We loved it. And uh, year two was amazing. We did Zion Conference, but not only that, we did Kids Conference for the very first time. And one of the things that we learned after such a powerful weekend doing that, really a new thing we'd never done before, is uh, we need more space. We need more space for our kids because we believe that God is gonna grow it. We already had so many kids last year, and so our team has been thinking, hey, what does that actually look like? What does it look like to create space for kids to experience the love of Jesus? And so we wanted to give you a little like a teaser on Friday of this week on social. We're going to be revealing our theme. We're going to be opening registration. We're going to be doing it in the summer. Uh, so it's got its own time, its own date. Uh, we just really believe that's going to allow us to give our full focus, our full attention, and give our very, very best to kids. So again, that's going to be for kids age four all the way to fifth grade. And um, if you don't have a kid that age, you can volunteer. You can help. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Let somebody else know on our staff or the Connect booth outside, and we would love to get you plugged in. Yeah, and one of the best ways to stay connected here at Zion is actually through this Connect card here. Now, I know for my wife and I, when we first started coming to Zion, we were just really looking for a community of believers just to do life with. And two and a half years ago, we just kind of took that next step and filled out one of these Connect cards, and we got plugged into our life group. And I can truly tell you guys that that has changed our lives for the better. It's They've really become not only of our best friends, but we've gone through a lot of loss this year, and I've had a lot of lung problems this year, and it's amazing knowing that every single day I have a community back behind me of someone praying for me and really contending for me of just everything that we're, um, that we're having. So I encourage you, fill out these Connect cards, bring it to that Next Steps booth in the back, and we'll actually have a special gift for you back there as well. There we 
go. As we shift into a time of giving, I wanted to highlight one of America's favorite holidays. In fact, it's coming up tomorrow. It's called Tax Day. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, I'm one of those guys. I'm a, I'm a planner. And so I, I'm the sort of person who, like, as soon as I get my paperwork, I, like, put it into TurboTax. I want to know, like, how much am I going to owe this year? Um, I see some people, like, with their phones, they're like, was Tax Day actually tomorrow? This is a little, that's a free reminder for you. But anyway, I was putting it in, and, and I realized we actually owed more money than we anticipated. Never been there? That was kind of our, our seat. And so the last couple months, Kendall and I have been like, all right, cool, let's save. Let's prepare. Let's get ready for what that is. And just this past week, I got a call from somebody in my family. And they said, hey, I just filed my taxes. Uh, every year I set aside a certain amount that I expect to pay. And I just had money left over. Like I owed less money than I would normally do somehow. And uh, I was thinking, God, what, what should I do with the leftover? And I just thought of you and Kendall. And guess what, guys? Here's the thing. It was exactly the gap that we had with ours. Like, how amazing is that? I wanted to read something for you. In, in the book of James, chapter one, it says this. It says that everything that is good and perfect is a gift from God. See, here's the thing. I, what I'm not saying is if you show up to church and you obey God and you do this, that God is just gonna give you surprise checks all the time. That, that's not what we're teaching here. That's not a prosperity gospel thing. But what I am saying is everything we have is a gift from God. And when we talk about giving, giving is a way that we acknowledge that all these things come from God. And sometimes I just feel like in this moment, even as I say that, there might be someone in the crowd saying, I don't know, man, I don't know. I think I am where I am because of my hard work. But let me ask you something. If you're an engineer, who do you think gave you that creativity? If you're an athlete, who do you think gave you that ability? If you're a business leader, who gave you that intellect? Like everything we have is a gift from God. Everything we are is a gift from God. And one of the ways that we worship is by saying, God, I see that. I acknowledge it. I thank you for that. And I'm going to give back as an act of trust and an act of worship. So if you want to actually give in that way today, if you're ready for that step, there are three ways you can do it. You can text the number on screen, 84321, text any amount. Um, you can do it the old fashioned way. We've got a giving box in the back. And I think the easiest way to do it, we've got a little QR code on that connect card on your seat. It'll take you exactly where you need to go on our website and you can do it there. Um, but listen, we've got a really great word for you today. Pastor John's been preparing a powerful message. So grab your notebooks, grab your Bibles, and let's welcome Pastor John. Good morning. Hey, I want to take a moment and greet our Zion online family. Can we clap one more time and just welcome everyone that's joining us online? Thank you so much for joining us. We love you wherever you're streaming in from. Uh, man, I meet people all of the time that say, hey, I'm a part of the online family. And uh, I always appreciate it, they say, uh, when you uh, just even recognize the fact that I am here uh, on the other side. And uh, we, you know, we just wanna make sure that every single person knows whether you're in the room or whether you're streaming on Line or whether you're hearing this in your car or maybe on a workout, that you are loved, that you're seen, that you're cared for, that we would love to connect with you. Uh, there are people on the other side of the YouTube chat that are literally right now uh, ready to connect with you, pray for you if you got stuff that you're going through in life and uh, give you some, some support in your spiritual journey. I'm so happy to be with you guys today. The sun is out. The sun is out. Who would think that would be something to celebrate here in South Orange County? But this year has been, been kind of interesting. But man, I am so excited for the word that God has put on my heart today. Are you guys ready to lean in? You ready for God's word? If you are, say, uh-huh. If you want to grow in your faith, say, let's grow. Okay. Um, Man, I'm ready. Luke 19 is where we're going to jump in. And if you have a copy of the scriptures, if you have a Bible app, it's going to be in the New Living Translation, Luke 19. It'll be on the big screen behind me. You can follow along. Verse 37 in Luke 19, it says this. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along praising God 
for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. The title of my message this morning is The Rocks Won't Show Me Up. The Rocks Won't Show Me Up. Father, I pray that in this house today we would get a revelation from your word that as we come into this place in space, we're aware of your presence. We're aware that we come here not first and foremost to get something that we need. We come here to give you what you deserve. That your church is not a place that is simply to provide helpful tips how to live a better life, but your church is a place of worship. Your church is a house of prayer. Your church is a place where your presence dwells. And Lord, we pray that in this place, you would be glorified and you would be honored and you would get the praise and the glory that you deserve. May you speak through me and activate us as a church to live, love, and look like you today, Jesus, in your name. And everyone said, amen. <clears throat> amen. Thanks for your grace with me. I'm struggling with a cold right now, so I'm going to do a little powerful pause here. And you can think about the title of my message as I drink a little water. What does he mean, the rocks won't show me up? That's what you're supposed to be asking right now. Today, I want to talk about the power of praise. And I want to talk a little bit about the cost of keeping our lips locked. Because many of us, we know um, what praise is. We know that it's, it's something that we just did. It's something that declares the glory of who God is. It's something that proclaims God's goodness. It's something that, that, that we do that thanks God for what he has done in our lives, but at times we don't know the power that comes from it, and sometimes we also don't know the power on the other side that the enemy likes to use to keep us locked in our lips, and what it can do to cause things to fester and to grow, things like doubt, things like worry, things like competition, criticism, and comparison. And But today I want to focus on the power of praise. In the passage that we just read in Luke chapter 19, Jesus the king enters the city of Jerusalem, and we see two groups of people that experienced the same reality but had a different response. The same reality but a different response. We were at... Ruby's diner yesterday morning with our boys. We took them to Cars and Coffee, and uh, anyone do, like ever do the Cars and Coffee thing? It's pre it's it, it's pretty cool. A dude from Detroit. I like my cars, and I like my coffee. So two great things. Um, we brought the kids, and they were loving it. And I told Kellen not to lean on that Lamborghini, but he did it anyway. And I'm like, oh man, where's the owner? Let's get out of here. So we went to Ruby's diner. <laughs> And we all ordered food, and uh, I got the Eggs Benedict. And I don't know, interesting choice. I just, I don't know, I was feeling it. And I ate the Eggs Benedict, and as we were leaving, uh, Taryn noticed that there was someone else that ordered the Eggs 
Benedict, and we saw as we were walking out of the restaurant that this individual was not only eating the eggs Benedict, but was using a straw to drink up the entirety of the hollandaise sauce on his plate. And this was not a child. This was a grown man, just like me. And my first thought was, that's disgusting. And my second thought was, I kind of respect that. <laughs> like, way to get after it. Way to just, like, get all of the life out of this experience. You know? What, we had the same meal, but two different responses. Same reality, different response. And one guy got way more out of that reality than the other. And the reality in life and the reality in Christian faith is that we all have the same reality. But it's your response that will make the difference when it comes to your life experience. The same reality is that Jesus loves you. Jesus saved you. Jesus rose from the grave. And if you have said yes to Jesus, you have his life. You're going to heaven and you have eternal life here today. But the reality is that there are some people who are saved and on their way to heaven and yet still living in a prison of fear, doubt, worry, apathy. And there are other people that are living with power, peace, confidence, joy, strength. They've broken free from fear. They're consistently growing in the in their faith, they're, they're, they're alive even when times are tough. They have joy. They have a, a perspective that gets above the clouds in life, and they are living with a genuine life-giving atmosphere. And it's all based on your response. See, the experience of your life really isn't based upon the realities of what happened to you, it's based upon how you respond to what happens to you in life. And we see two different types of people that have the same reality. The King Jesus enters in the city of Jerusalem on a donkey in Luke chapter 19, but two different responses, and it changes everything. You have the people who see Jesus, his disciples, his followers for who he is, the king, and they praise him. And it says that these people not only experience the joy of that moment, but they eventually change the world. Then you have the Pharisees who kept silent, and they eventually were the ones who yelled, crucify him. Same reality different responses. And what I see is that when you lack praise, stuff dies. And I've noticed this. This is, this is something that I've, I've noticed. I mean, um, I have friends that, you know, I, I went to school with these friends in seminary, and I remember in seminary going through all of this study about God. It was powerful information, but it was during that season that I was the driest because I had grown up in a Pentecostal church that was all about praise and worship, and we created environments and experiences to encounter the presence of God. But then there was a season in my life where I was like, just give me the meat. Just give me the word. Give me the, f I just want to go to a fill in the blank church so that I can fill in some blanks and feel like I've learned a few things and, and leave and, and have some handles and information about God. And that'll do it for me. And I tried that for a long time. And, and even during my Bible college and seminary years, I went to those kinds of churches. And what I found was that I was learning a lot about God, but I was still distant from God. I was around Jesus, but distant from Jesus. I had information about God's heart, but I didn't have God's heart. And 
I, I, I found myself absorbing stuff in a church experience like a sponge, but I wasn't reflecting the goodness of God, the praise of who he is, and, and my worship and adoration. I, I didn't realize I was made to be a mirror and not just a sponge. And I was finding my soul dying. Stuff in my life was dying my passion for, for God, my passion for people, my compassion for others was dying. When we lack praise, stuff dies. I've seen it with some, some of my friends that I went to Bible college and seminary with who never, uh, thank God I had moments in my life where I, I had these 180 shifts where I was brought back into the power of God's presence, and, and God gave me a vision for a church before we launched Zion Church that we'd be a prayer and worship movement because it's only God's presence that changes everything. And yes, we will teach, and yes, we will reach, but the church's primary focus and reason for existence is to worship God and to give him what he deserves. And the presence of God is the most powerful promotional tool for a world that desperately needs not more information, but fresh revelation. And I have friends who, who know so much about God that have walked away from the church and deconstructed their faith and stuff has died because they lack praise. When, when you lack praise, you end up crucifying people. The Pharisees lacked praise, and they ended up crucifying Christ. When you lack praise, you'll end up criticizing people. I, I, I find it time and time again, the, the people that struggle with the most bitterness, criticism, um, judgment, the people that, I, I guarantee you, the people that are, that are spewing the most criticism and hate on social media vastly lack praise in their lives. When you lack praise, you'll always find ways to criticize, to condemn, to judge. I, 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 I I, I know that the Karens of this world are people that lack praise. Because you'll always find something else to talk about. I don't know what a male Karen is. A Marin? A Kevin? I looked it up online. Someone said Kevin. And by the way, if you're a Karen, uh, there's grace for you. I love you. This is just a world. This is a term of, that the world is using for... It's unfortunate that you were born with the name Karen, though. We love you so much. Like, that's so unfortunate. Um, I, I, I looked it up, and I, I asked Google, the source of all wisdom, what's a male Karen? And there were two options, Kevin and Terry. And I'm like, oh, no, my father-in-law's name is Terry. <laughs> He's awesome, though. Uh, I guarantee you, though, the... The, the Karens and the Marins on San Clemente Life posting all their comments. I'm worried about this. I'm fearful about this. I hate this. I can't believe that there's new this. Ah, don't change my city. They don't praise God. They lack praise. So you got to have something to talk about. You end up killing things that are great in life when you lack praise. There's, there's, there's so much power and praise that we're going to get to, but there's also a lot of consequence to not praising God, to not being someone that is, is overflowing with thanksgiving and gratitude and expressive worship. And that's why Solomon tells us in his rich wisdom in Proverbs that there's an ability to produce death and life in the power of the tongue. See, a lot of us don't, recognize the power and praise. And going back to Luke 19, Jesus actually calls it the way to peace. He says it if you go back to verses 9, I'm sorry, chapter 19, verses 41 through 42. He says, how I wish you would understand of all people the way to peace. Now, yes, Jesus is saying, he's saying two things. He's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
But there's also a deeper revelation that sometimes commentaries and scholars don't get. What he's also saying, because he just talked about the power of praise, and if, if we don't do it, all of creation praises him. It's a natural thing. It, when the king enters the room, the, uh, the, 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 like there's this natural eruption of praise that actually produces a pathway to peace. Now, when we hear peace, we think most of the time like Burke Williams' peace. Which, if you're a parent right now, that kind of sounds amazing. But peace is the word shalom in Hebrew, which is a far richer, far more robust, and deeper definition of peace. Peace means everything. Shalom means everything. Like, it includes God's victory. It includes God's presence. It includes God's plans and purposes. It includes God's power. It includes everything is the way it's supposed to be. And Jesus says that the pathway to this peace, or let's call it life that you want, the pathway is through the power of praise. The power of praise. He says that the way to experience God's perspective, his peace, his presence and power is through the pathway of praise. When Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. And, and he's the humble king that comes to save his people. When we go back to verses 37 and 38, it said that his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. And here's what they said. They gave a a reason for their shouting, a reason for their singing, a reason for their worship and their praise. Blessings on the king. They saw Jesus as king, who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Where God is praised, God is king. Conversely, where God isn't king, God isn't praised. You can always tell if a church has made Jesus not just their savior, but their king by their praise and worship experience. See, a lot of churches have made Jesus their savior and they're thankful that Jesus is their savior. But you know that Jesus is truly king at a church in their praise and their worship experience. The atmosphere of praise and worship will be the definition if Jesus is not just the savior of our sins, but the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's not just our savior, but he's worthy of all worship and adoration. Why? Because you act different, differently around royalty. When a king, when, if you enter the throne room of a king, you act differently. Even physically here on planet earth, when there were kingdoms and there were monarchies and, and all that, you bowed before a king. You revered a king with awe and worship. When the king entered the room, there was respect, there was honor, there was admiration, there was reverence, there was, there was a declaration of who the king was was when a king would come back into the city after a military victory, they would gather and praise and hail the king and they would honor the king for the victory that was accomplished. Praise is what defines the lordship of Jesus in our life. Psalm 22, 3 says, You are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. You are wholly enthroned on the praises, another translation and another way that it said is on the praises of your people. Also, God inhabits the praises of his people. When I praise God, there's two things that happen. I'm reminded that there is a king 
who's in charge that isn't me. And it's the most freeing place that I can be. I'm, I'm reminded when I praise God that this whole thing called life isn't about me, and it's way better that way. I'm reminded who is king and who's in control. When I praise God, I, I honor him and I give him the glory that he deserves. And, and, and this beautiful thing happens. God, in his word, says that he inhabits the praises of his people who honor him as king. Do you know that you can be in a church gathering and God still not be present? I guess God's present in a macro way where, because God's, God, there, there is no place God cannot be. But I'm talking about there are environments, there are people groups, there are, there are, um, there are spaces, there are kinds of churches where I believe God is more attracted to hang out in, to dwell in. It's, it's all throughout the Bible. Um, another way to say it is what moves God's heart? What is God's love language? Right? God's love language is genuine, authentic praise. And you're kind of like, right now, you're like, does God, like, why does God need my praise? You ever thought that? Why does the God of, of the universe need my praise? Is he insecure? Does, does he like to just be told over and over again who he is? Does he need constant affirmation like my husband? Like, why does God need my praise? God, God, like, I just want to be clear. God needs nothing from you. God is the all-sufficient creator of the universe who does not need our praise. But the reason why he's attracted to our praise is because you need to praise God. Because when you and I praise God, we have a right perspective of who God is. And when we have a right perspective of who God is, all of these worries, all of these fears, all of these doubts, all of these lesser things and lesser concerns wash away and they go beneath us and we're elevated to where God is. And we begin to receive his thoughts, his revelation, and we also are able to dwell in an atmosphere where his presence abides. He says, when you honor me as king, I love to hang out there. And that's where I love to do my best work. Praise, praise gives us this beautiful uh, pathway where God loves to show up and, and he loves to speak. He loves to minister to our heart's deepest needs. He loves to heal. He loves to give us guidance and power for daily living. When I praise God, my spirit levels up my mind and my heart to where God is. I, I, I get on God's level. Um, there, there's this um, very real thing that's happening right now. Uh, called, it's called cloud seeding. Have you heard of it? Any conspiracy theorists out there? No, see... Like, like cloud seeding is a real thing that's happening. Um, it's not a conspiracy theory. There are conspiracy theories attached to the reality of what's happening right now. Um, but yeah, it's like a real thing that they're doing with the Santa Ana Watershed Project. It's like a five-year deal where essentially, if you don't know what cloud seeding, and I'm, it's seeding, not seeding like a chair, like seeding, like planting clouds in the sky, sci-fi stuff, but it's happening. Um, they, they essentially are are um, taking um, moisture from existing clouds, and they're, say, they're saying that they're doing it near um, areas where it's at the base of mountains and stuff like that so that it gets into the river and there's, it increases the water supply and all that sort of stuff. I'm not totally convinced that it's just in the mountain areas because I've been experiencing the weather here by the beach. Um, but it's crazy. They're actually planting clouds in this. This is the world we live in. 
they are science they have scientifically found ways to plant clouds in the sky above us to create more moisture did you know that the enemy the devil is a cloud seeder in your life and he loves to plant clouds of disappointment clouds of worry clouds of regret, clouds of pain, clouds of discouragement, clouds of denial, clouds of loneliness. He will plant clouds in your life. And it's praise that elevates you above the clouds so that you can experience the goodness of God even in the midst of your pain. You need to get above the clouds. And I know some of us walked in here with heavy stuff. Some of us walked in here with burdens that are, that are so heavy that we're carrying on our shoulders. Some of us walked in with deep discouragement and disappointment. Some of us walked in with pain in our bodies and pain in our minds and pain in our relationships. But I'm telling you, if you, even when you don't feel like it, the power of praise elevates you above the clouds so that your soul gets lighter, so that the air gets clearer, so that you get to see that God is who he said he is, that he will always be faithful. He will always be good. He is the first and the last. He is who he always will be, and he will never change, and he loves you, and he's for you, and this is not the end of your story. It's praise that actually elevates you above the clouds because you declare who God is and what he's done. I was sick this past week, and um, there are two types of people in this world, those that, that get sick a lot and you never know about it, and it, it's, t- it's just moms. That's just moms. You just, they're sick all the time, but you never know about it because they don't talk about it. Then the other type of people, they're rarely sick, but when they do, they tell everybody about it. That's me. And, and so, you know, I was sick this past week. You can hear a little bit, and I'm like, oh, life is over. I always feel like, like I will never be well again when I'm sick, you know? I'm so dramatic, and on Friday morning, I was just like, hey, you know, talking to Taryn. <laughs> My throat hurts. <laughs> I got a headache. <laughs> and she literally said, hey, get upstairs. I'll, I'll watch the kids take 20 minutes, go spend time with God, go praise God. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I, I, I literally did. I fell on my face, and I just start praising God. And it's just like, boom. Like, my soul came to life again. My, it's like I was reconnected with the presence of God, and and you know, and, and it, you know, stuff came out right that was like, oh, I'm carrying this. It wasn't just a headache, but it's like, oh, I'm carrying this stress and this thing that's overwhelming me, and this thing that I'm just thinking about that I feel like I have to fix today. And God was like, get on my level. I am the king of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I am in control. I am the way maker. I am Jehovah Jireh, the provider. John, remember when I saved you from that? Remember when I provided for you back then? John, remember who you were and now who you are. And it was like in 20 minutes through praise and worship, God elevated me and I walked out of that room lighter. I walked out of that room with a clear perspective. Praise is so powerful because you need God's perspective. This is the power of your words because your life will move in the direction that your words take it. And in a time of confusion and uncertainty in our world, we need to live with clarity and with confidence. And that actually comes through the power of praise, where you see and you declare who God is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. That's why the psalmist said in one, uh, Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then he repeats it, praise the Lord. 
Praise, in definition, refers to lifting God up. It's the joyful recounting of who God is and what he's done. Praise is an uninhibited, overflowing, joyful, and in Scripture, even boisterous response to the goodness of God. This is why the title of this message is that the rocks won't show me up. Because Jesus makes this crazy pronouncement that if people refuse to praise God, creation itself, inanimate objects like rocks, still know how to praise him. Praise is not an emotional response for certain Enneagram types. Praise is a natural response to everything created by God. We were made to praise God. Well, that's just for Joey and the, and the band and the people with good voices. No, let everything, let's put it back on there. Everything, is there anyone here that doesn't have breath today? That would be scary. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And if you don't think it's for you, praise the Lord a second time. I used to think that it was just for the really charismatic people, the very demonstrative people. But it, it, and, I, and I was that kid that was the pastor's kid that was super stubborn in church. Where it was like, there was this one song where everyone would lift their hands. It was like kind of robotic. And I was always like, I ain't going to do it. And it was the, do you remember the We Exalt Thee song? Any old school Christians in here? We exalt thee. And it was like literally as it happened, we exalt thee. And every time I'm like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. And now, and now I have a son named Kellen. Not going to do it, dad. Um, and because I always was just like, no, that's for that kind of personality. That's, kind of, that's for that person. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to look weird. I'm not going to be kind of kooky, spooky. Like, like I'm not going to be that person. That's not me. That's, that's for Pastor Hal. We literally had a Pastor Hal. Um, but that's not my deal. And let everything, let everyone Everyone, not for some people and for some personalities. Praise offers power for every personality. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And I have found so much freedom in my life from breaking free from my insecurities, breaking free from my pride, breaking free from my past experience, breaking free from feeling like this is manipulation or feeling like this is mechanical, breaking free and just going, no, I was made to praise God. I was made to worship him. I, I, I may not have the, the quality of voice that Joey Molina has, a.k.a. Hey, the Christian Justin Bieber, but God didn't ask me to make a perfect noise to him. He asked me to make a joyful noise to him. And I can do that. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Why would the Bible tell us to do it? Because it's powerful, because it's life-giving, because it's freeing, because it gets you out of your image consciousness, because it gets you out of the fear of man, because it makes you available for God to bless you when you know how to worship him and praise him and get proper perspective for your life. Worship in heaven is not contemplative. That's just not my thing. This is how I praise the Lord. No, you don't. That's not praising God. That's thinking about God. That's okay. But we can't act like stuff is that isn't. Worship in heaven, when you get a picture of the throne room in heaven, worship in heaven is loud. Worship in heaven is boisterous. Worship in heaven is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Glory, glory, glory and honor and power do your name. Worship in heaven is demonstrative. People don't, don't just stand around with a coffee in their hand. When you're in the presence of God all throughout Scripture, people fall on their feet here on earth and in heaven. 
They fall on their face as if they were dead because they're in the presence of the king of the universe who has fire in his eyes and lightning flashes and, and thunder flashes from the throne. If thunder can flash, it's going to happen in heaven. But this is what heaven, like, like this is what we're going to. Like this is the reality of who God is. Like, people are laying their crowns down. People are bowing. Like, like stuff is loud and expressive and joyful and life-filling. This is what praise is all about. Man, give us a loud church, God. How about that? Give us a boisterous church. Give us a... Give us a, a church like, you know, I had a, I, like I was even prepping this message differently like throughout the week and I, I really felt the Lord, like I was actually in line at Chick-fil-A last night. That's where the Lord speaks to me. I was like, I've been prepping the message for a while, you know, and I had already been prepping. It's not just on Saturdays, but I just want, I, I was like, okay, putting things together. And it, like, it was a very linear message on the power of praise. I was going to give you four keys to the power of praise. And God was saying, hey, John, would you be willing for, like, for, for me just to mess this up? And I said, uh, yeah, mess it up. And and. and and I just felt like God was like, will you just, will you, like, will you just allow me to mess this up a little bit when it comes to this thing called church? Like, sometimes we, we just, we come in and it's, everything is so mechanical in our Christian life if we're not careful and it could become so routine where it's like, get the kids in the car or I get in the car and then I get the coffee and then we do a couple songs and then there's that host block moment and then there's the giving moment where I try to tune out and then there's the message moment. I'm just kidding. You guys are, you guys are really generous. You're not like other churches, but sometimes people T tune that out and then okay I know he's going to give me the TED talk the message I'm going to get maybe a couple takeaways and then there's maybe a closing song maybe some people for prayer and then I'm going to go maybe you know connect with some friends sometimes we need God to mess up our church services sometimes we need God to mess us up when's the last time you got messed up in the presence of God when's the last time you cried and it doesn't mean that you have to be emotional but when's the last time that you did something uncomfortable When's the last time you got out of, your, out of your comfort zone? Because worship is messy. Worship is expressive. Worship is demonstrative. Worship is passionate. Because love is not supposed to look professional. I'm so sick of trying to be a professional Christian when God has always called us to be children who put their hands up and say, God, I desperately need you. I don't care what I look like. God did not call us to be religious professionals. He called us to be children. And sometimes we can get too cute with it, and sometimes we can become religious professionals. And, and, and God, God, wants to, God wants to take us beyond our comfort to give us the life that we actually want. See, the Pharisees, they were uncomfortable with this kind of praise and and. Um, they, they missed their moment with Jesus. Scripture says they missed their moment of visitation. And, and, and you might be here and you might be like, well, I, I'm not comfortable lifting my hands. And lifting your hands, by the way, isn't an emotional thing. It's actually a Hebrew like word when it comes to praise. It's a Hebrew form of praise. It's, it, it's, there are different ways that we're actually instructed to praise the Lord. And it's actually a form of praise that lifts God up and also declares our need and our dependency for him. I'm not comfortable. Well, get comfortable with it. <laughs> he got quiet. Get comfortable with it. I guess that's okay. Like, there are a lot of things in my spiritual journey that I was uncomfortable with, that I'm now very comfortable with. All you got to do is go, oh, okay, there's power in that. Cool, I'm going to try it. I'm going to practice it. I'm going to experiment with it. And I'm going to actually give God my worship. I'm going to give God my praise. It's going to be uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. See, 
God came in the form of Jesus to comfort the afflicted, and he came to afflict the comfortable. And sometimes we need God to take us out of our comfort zones and, and, and bring us into the most powerful form of praise. Are you ready for it? It's called a sacrifice of praise. And in Luke 19, Jesus enters as king and the people laid down their coats and offered it to the feet of Jesus. It was costly, in other words. They laid down something that kept them comfortable and they put it at the feet of Jesus and they said, I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to trust that you're going to take me where you want me to go. What is your coat? Is it singing? What, 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 what is your coat that keeps you comfortable? Is it, is it lifting your hands? What is your coat? Is it shouting? Is it declaring who God is out loud? What's your coat? Is it dancing? That's my coat, by the way. Painfully white. Like, so scared of our first dance at our wedding, like Tara knows. And for me, at Zion Conference, on Saturday night, if you were there, when Brian Barcelona was leading us into an activated experience of praise, he talked about a sacrifice of praise. And everyone in the room got nervous, including myself, and excited at the same time because I'm kind of like, what's my coat? What's that sacrifice for me? Because everyone's coat looks different. And for me, it, it hasn't been singing and lifting my hands, but there, there is this thing called undignified worship where there was a guy named David who was a man after God's heart. God goes, that's my guy. That's my man. And, and, and there, there were moments in his life where he was so like just, wow, God, you're so good. You're so amazing. He literally started dancing. It was undignified worship. He allowed himself to not look good in the perception of what people thought. Hey, that's foolish. Why would you do that? That's too much, that's too crazy. And man, I go, oh, that's my coat. That's my sacrifice of praise. And he hit that moment and he said, whatever is a sacrifice of praise for you, I just want you to go for it and give it to God. And it was at that moment, like I think it might be even be recorded or something. I hope it's not. Um, but it was just, it was this eruption that came from my life. I start hopping around and I'm like, I don't know who this is, but he is free. He is free. And it's not about mechanics. It's not about manipulation. It's about a sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise is what breaks you free from your comfort that ultimately will give you the freedom and will break you free from the fear of man that you long for. And I just began going, this isn't about the people around me. This is about who's in the room. And if there's a king in the room, oh my God, you are worthy of worship. Not just my voice, not just my, my hands, but I'm going to dance before you. And God broke something free in my life that night, and I haven't gone back. I felt like Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone, where I ran out in the middle of the street and I said, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid anymore. And this is the power of praise, where you can literally do something as a spiritual practice that will help you walk outside this room and go, I'm not afraid anymore. I have confidence. I have peace. I'm not so scared about what I look like. I'm not scared about going for it in other areas of my life because if you can do it in church, you can live a life of fearlessness and courage and joy out in the world. My prayer for us is that we would be able to say, I'm not afraid anymore. What's your coat today? Sacrifice of praise is getting uncomfortable. And a sacrifice of praise, there's one deeper thing with it, is there are times in your life where you will not feel like praising God. 
And it's in those moments where you offer him praise in the midst of your pain, in the midst of infertility, in the midst of brokenness in your family, in the midst of a cancer diagnosis, in the midst of financial instability, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of your deepest despair. It's at those moments when you offer God a sacrifice of praise. You can only offer him that thing that is so precious to him on this side of eternity. You offer him something that you cannot offer him in heaven. It's called praise in your pain, praise in the doubt, praise in the loneliness, praise in the lack, praise in the discouragement. And when you are here today in the midst of the unknown and you go, God, I praise you for who you are. I praise you that you're good. I praise you that even if I don't get another thing from you, you have given me everything in Jesus Christ. God, I praise you that you have been faithful in my past and you have moved mountains in my past. You will be faithful in my future. You are for me. You are not against me. I praise you that you sent your Holy Spirit to literally flow through my veins so that when I face trials in life, I got strength supernatural that comes from a different place. I praise you that you are king of kings. When there is a war that's waging in the Middle East and we don't know if it's today or tomorrow when you're coming back, I praise you that you are on the throne and you are in control and you are the only peace. You are the only solution. I praise you that I do not have to live in fear, but I can live in faith and confidence. This is the sacrifice of praise that elevates you to places in God's presence that will break you free and will change your life. And so would everyone around the room, would you just stand with me right now? And just, just close your eyes right where you are. I actually want you just to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine yourself. I want you to imagine yourself in the throne room of heaven right now. And I want you to imagine what is actually happening right now. There is a king on the throne. I want you to put yourself there right now. And as you put yourself there right now, where are your problems? Where are your doubts? Where is the discouragement? What's holding you back? In heaven right now, as the angels are crying, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. Glory, glory, glory to the one who has the keys to hell, death, and the grave, the risen King. Glory to the one, put yourself there, glory to the one who died but is now alive. Glory to the one who came riding in to the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, but one day, maybe very soon, is going to come riding back to the city of Jerusalem on a white horse with fire in his eyes, and he will make all things right, and he will bring peace to the earth, and he will bring his rule and his reign. Put yourself there. Put yourself there. Right in this place, begin to put yourself there with your lips and begin to thank him for who he is. Even right now as the band plays, begin to thank him for who God is. There's a praise that only you can offer God out of your mouth. 
if you don't know what to praise him for, just say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Jesus, thank you that you are king. Jesus, there's no one like you. Jesus, may you be lifted up. Out of your lips right now, begin to praise him for what he's done. What has he saved you from? I just want to activate you. Church, be activated today. This is a house of worship. This is a house of praise. This is a house of thanksgiving. This is a house that is meant to honor God. Thank him for saving you from your sins. Thank you for freeing you from your addiction. Thank you for giving you a marriage and a family. Thank you for your kids. Thank you. Worship God right now. All across this place, lift up your voices. Lift up your voices right now. Worship the Lord. Lift up your hands all across this place. Give God your, give God your body. May your body be submitted to the Lordship of God. Honor the King in this room. There is no one like you. Lord, we don't know when we have another moment, and we don't want to miss your moment of visitation. We don't want to miss your moment of visitation. You are here, Jesus, and so we honor you. We glorify you. Just keep magnifying the holy name of Jesus. Just keep worshiping him. Holy, holy, holy. We glorify your name. Yeah, just keep lifting him up. Keep lifting him up. Take us into worship. Hallelujah. We honor your holy name. You are mighty, Lord. You are powerful. You control all things. You are worthy to be praised. Oh, come on, my You are a healer. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up right, your little song. Come on. Cause you got a lion inside of those rocks. Get up there and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a
as we were worshiping um, I just uh, felt that something broke over the room and I felt I literally felt the wind of his spirit like come over me and I just felt that he said this is what moves my heart this is the kind of sacrifice that moves my heart it can't just be a few people I'm looking for my church to be laid down lovers. I'm looking for my church to be free of the fear of man. And if you break free from the fear of man, I will pour out my spirit upon my sons and daughters. And this isn't just one Sunday a praise message. This is the new normal that we're walking in. So I just bless you, church. I bless you and I just see that this is not the only atmosphere of the presence of God. Your car is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Your bedroom is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Your living room is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit where you have the decision to offer Him a sacrifice of praise, not just one time a week, but every single day. I'm telling you that God's about to pour something out over your life if you would be willing to give him a sacrifice every single day, church. Jesus, you are worthy. Let's just lift our hands one more time all across this room. We just say, in a spirit of unity, God, you are worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy. God, there is no one like you. You are matchless. You are the king. You are the victor. God, we lift our eyes to you today and we leave with a new perspective. God, we leave with our eyes above the clouds. We thank you, Jesus, for breakthrough. We thank you, God, that you've set the captives free today. In Jesus' name, let's give God one more shout of praise in this house. Come on. <laughs> so good, church. We have our prayer team up here. And just like John said, don't let this ever become religious to you. Don't, don't check this moment out. Don't just leave. If you have something going on in your world, prayer changes things. Prayer shifts things. It's actually our opportunity to humble ourselves and say, I can't do it on my own. God, I need you. God, I need you to come through in my family. God, I need you to come through in my marriage. I need you to come through at work or in my body. And so let's be a church that's dependent on the Lord in every single way. And so come receive prayer from our team. They would absolutely love to pray with you. Be blessed, church. We love you guys. Have an amazing week. Let's give him the praise that he's due in Jesus' name. We said, come on, my soul, don't you get shot on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shot on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion. Lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up there and praise the Lord. We sing, all oh, the earth will shout your praise. My hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
Cause all that I have is my heart. Hey. 